Well, thank you, Simon. And uh, as I said to a gentleman at the front here, it's uh, not every day I get to do this, only uh, as a favor to Simon and the JSE. So thank you, the JSE, for allowing me to do this. And it's nice to see some ladies in the audience. Uh, this time last year was a men-only affair. So perhaps this year the ladies will have a much better investment success than the gentlemen in the audience. And I'm told we have a very active webcast on tonight, including one gentleman, I believe, listening in from Afghanistan. So if you're there, sir, I hope you get some interest uh, from this presentation. So I've been covering small to mid caps, uh, food and agriculture now for 23 years in this country. Uh, I came here in 1996, uh, having got uh, uh, enthralled by the JSC at a very young age because I had family living here. And uh, it's a sector of a market which I think is very undercovered even today in 2018. And it's a sector that is not consistently covered by analysts. Generally, younger analysts come in, they look at a few stocks in the sector, and then they move on to bigger and better things. Uh, so for an analyst like myself to have covered a sector for 23 consecutive years, uh, I say that uh, not to, uh, to blow my own trumpet, but it gives you a sense of history and a sense of background as to where companies have come from and where they're going to. I said to a friend of mine last week who I've known for 20 years, uh, in 1996, the first two stocks that I picked up as a young analyst uh, in my late 20s was Bola Metcalf, which I still cover. It was 32 cents of a time. It's now trading at 10 rand. And I picked up Cashbot when I met Pat Goldrick. He was trading at 3 rand 53. We're now at about 450 rand. So sometimes there's a, there's, a, there's a sense of longevity in covering stocks because small companies today can be the larger companies of tomorrow. I had a coffee yesterday with Dr. Chris van der Merwe. Uh, who many years ago founded the Kuro Holdings School Business in a small church hall in Durbanville. Uh, I met him a, sh a few years after that when the valuation of a company was only 100 million rand when PSG bought a 50% stake. If you take the combined value right now of the companies he's created, which is Kuro Holdings and Stargio, we're at about 23 to 24 billion rand. So sometimes finding small companies, they can become quite large. So this performance here, uh, as, as I'm saying, is all about consistency. Um, as I said to the gentleman at the front there, I can't always have a good year because then, you know, I'd, I'd be infallible. And you have to be fallible to, to actually have a, have a long-term career. So I had one bum year in 2016, but I'm hoping that uh, the stocks I've chosen this year uh, will, uh, will, uh, will give me some good stead. How does this thing? It's just, there we are. There's that, there's that again. And that's what my 2017 selection did. It was up and down. And my star performer was Astral Foods. Uh, if you include the dividends, it was a 17.5% return. And my, and my aim is always to beat benchmark. So people say, oh, you've only made 17.5% return. But if you had invested in the benchmark, the main indices, you'd have basically either come out flat or only up, up 7%. So that's my, always my, my aim is to consistently beat the two benchmarks that I play in. And then if you look at the website and the presentations, I always put in my previous selections going all the way back. And then uh, we come to the, the main body of the presentation. There are two parts to this presentation to my clients because I only principally um, market my ideas to institutional clients. And then as a favor to the JSC and to Simon, who I've known for many years, um, I do the presentation to a, a much wider audience. So this year, there were two parts. There was a food and agricultural part which went out to my clients towards the end of November 2017. And then was the small cap section, which went out in 2018. So there are two separate segments to this presentation, so there's no confusion. Again, those of the stocks I chose last year, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, CIL, which for many years uh, was a top performing stock in, uh, in my fund, had a terrible year last year. To use Her Majesty's words, it was an annus horribilis, where everything that could have gone wrong went wrong regarding government interference, uh, union bashing, uh, earnings, losses, you name it, they had it uh, as, as one standard feature. And then on the, on the flip side, at the very bottom, Astral Foods, uh, which uh, in 2016 had a terrible earnings period because of a drought leading to much higher input costs on the maize and soya price. Last year, sought. Uh, I chose a stock last year at 124 rand and some change. Uh, it nearly doubled uh, in the course of 2017, and I put it again uh, in my portfolio for 2018 which is why this slide with, uh, with Oliver Twist there says, please, sir, I want some more. Uh, my view is if you have some great stocks in the portfolio, uh, there is a, a temptation to cut and run. Uh, I'm saying if you have a great stock, why should you cut and run? Perhaps if the fundamentals are still the same, just hang on. And that's proved to be the case for the last few months in my food side. So that was my 2018 selection. The ones with the stars, uh, Zeta, Astral Foods, Pioneer, and Senves are basically rollovers from last year. 
very much uh, my scenario, uh, as I've just done a, a presentation or a discussion right now with Classic FM. My main predication to agricultural and food stocks at the start of 2017 was the significant drought we had in this country in 2016. So input costs, particularly maize, soar. At one point, the price of, of maize was up to 5,000 rand a ton. So if you're rearing a chicken, milling food for people, and, you, and your input costs substantially spike, it is very difficult to pass that rapid rise in cost onto the underlying consumer, which means you must take some margin pain for yourself. And that's exactly what happened in many of the food counts in 2016. In 2017, with a large maize harvest coming in of 17 million tons, the input costs fell dramatically, and maize is now trading below 2,000 rand a ton. And as such, companies that use a great deal of maize in their production of food, chicken companies and milling companies, saw so substantially better um, uh, operating margins and, uh, and lower costs through their system. So they had, a, they had a very, very good run. So I stuck them back in. Other stocks which I'm very, very keen on is companies which sit on very large discounts to net asset value. AEEI, a Western Cape-based empowerment company, the same with Grand Parade Investments, both Western Cape. Uh, Ellie's Holdings I've put in before, uh, and, I've, and it's been in and out. And then uh, we've got IO, which listed very quietly on the 21st of December. And from nowhere, a 14.8 billion rand IT company appeared out of the blue. And it went mostly uh, over the eyes of many of the institutions who I service because it was listed before Christmas. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be talking about all of those briefly going forward. So the food stocks, as I mentioned, on the 23rd of September uh, of November, that's where their price is. And I've benchmarked the index from that time to as of when I updated the slide as of yesterday. So that's the total aggregate of the, the four stocks, but I haven't included dividends. If I were to put dividends in, uh, it would have been a little bit better, but I only do those towards the end of the year. So the main feature there, once again, is Astral Foods, which is up nearly 50%. Pioneer Foods, again, had a nice run. Uh, on the back of, uh, of a new CEO coming in and the expectation that 2018 will see a significant margin recovery after a terrible year last year. Stenvers is one of the country's largest grain companies listed on ZARX, which most people have never heard of, which I think will do very well going forward. But currently, it's, it's just slipped off its best uh, due to some, uh, some operational issues. And then Zeta Investments, part of a PSG group, is basically a play on Pioneer Foods because inside Zeta Investments, approximately 60% of Zeta is allied to Pioneer Foods. So all in all, in the first uh, few months of the food stocks, I'm up 17.3%, which is uh, a nice uh, four times benchmark, which again, uh, I'm very happy to, to exceed. And all of the stocks, uh, without question, I still want to own and hold for the rest of 2018. And if as, if, as I expect, the maize and soya harvest this year will also be quite good, leading to more rollover and carry on of stocks into 2019's financial year, I'll probably pick most of the stocks again towards the end of this year into 2019, because the prospects in agriculture remain very buoyant. None. Uh, Enterprise is part of Pioneer Foods, uh, sorry, it's part of uh, Tiger Brands, excuse a slip, and Tiger Brands is an Aussie 40 company, and I don't cover large cap stocks. Uh, Pioneer Foods, it's, uh, it's now a large stock. Uh, going back to my opening preamble about small companies becoming large companies, um, I first picked up coverage of Pioneer Foods when it was an over-the-counter listed company uh, based in Paul, trading at that stage at about nine rand a share. Uh, that was before the, uh, the consolidation, or should I say before the split. Uh, I listed Pioneer Foods back in 2008 and we raised money at 25 rand. And uh, the stock at its all-time high got to 226 rand from memory. It's now back to roughly about 100 in, in, the, in the mid 130s. So I stick with companies that I have, I have historic connection with. Why should I give up covering give up covering a large company when it used to be a small company? I have this historic connections and coverage of these companies, which I certainly don't want to give up. And I can walk in through the door of Pioneer Foods and speak to any of the, the, the key uh, members of staff there because I've been with them for the last decade plus. So Pioneer Foods, to me, is a, is a, is a big mid-cap. Had a terrible 2017, as I've mentioned, purely because of its input costs uh, were completely out of kilter. Its procurement of maize was, was just horrific. We then had a drought in the, uh, in the, in the dry fruit, uh, in the fruit market, and it's a big buyer of dry fruit. And it couldn't basically recover the costs of substantially higher um, inputs to its business from the consumer. Uh, so we saw a near 50% fall in earnings in Pioneer in 2017 of a share price from an all-time high of 226 to 229 Rand, fell to a low of 112 Rand 50 cents in early November. 
Now, also in September last year, Phil Rue, the very well-regarded pioneer CEO, stepped down. Uh, he, was, uh, he was replaced by an insider called Tertius Carstens, uh, who ran the very large uh, milling and baking operation for many, many years. And I've known Tertius for over a decade. So he had a plan to try and recover uh, the operating margins inside Pioneer Foods, and that has started to happen with substantially lower input costs. Now, Pioneer Foods is an entity because it has a very large staples business, wheat, um, mealy meal, uh, bread, pasta, buys 4 million tons of grains a year. It's the largest buyer of basic grains in this country. So if you're suddenly seeing your input cost fall dramatically year on year, you're going to get some form of operational margin leverage going forward in your business. So even though the underlying economy as we stand right now with the consumer remains quite tight, the, le the levers that Pioneer can pull to try and pick itself up from its, uh, from its past woes are certainly being pulled. And I'm expecting Pioneer this year to have a, a not, a, not a, a brilliant year, but only happened in 2019 because of its, of its March interim and a September year end. But uh, so far, uh, the stock from a low of 115 rand when I chose it got to 145 rand. It's now back in the mid 130s. And I still think it's a stock, given what's going on with Tiger Brands, which I think uh, could uh, attract the attention of a wider market because as Tiger Brands covers, uh, tries to recover from its... Uh, its food poisoning scandal. Its management will be far more um, diverted with litigation and sorting out its mess than probably looking after their own business. So perhaps Pioneer Foods, which is the number two in the marketplace, can, uh, can pick up some brownie points and, uh, and pick up some market share. Zeta, again, is a play on Pioneer Foods, a company that I've covered since 2006. Um, its main asset is a 26% stake in Pioneer Foods, which is worth circa 8 billion rand in its portfolio. It also has uh, virtual ownership of Cape Span, the large fruit exporter. It has a large stake of 41% in Carp Agri, the Western Cape agricultural business. And it has a very, very nice business in seeds called Zod. If you include a small stake in African land and, uh, and Quantum Foods, the egg company, that makes up Zeta. It's about a 12 to 13 billion rand portfolio. Now, the reason why I like this company is, one, it's run, it's run and owned by PSG. And PSG generally tend not to buy bad companies. They buy really good companies with great long-term prospects. They hang on to them and they tend to invest and grow them. So inside Zeta, you've got Pioneer as the anchor. I've told you that I expect Pioneer this year to have a very good recovery and more so into 2019. So you can buy Zeta, which is a Pioneer proxy, currently at a 15% discount to some, of, to some of the parts. And I like to buy businesses with quality assets at a discount. So I can buy a rand of assets for 85 cents. So if Pioneer recovers and its share price goes up, that'll have a leverage effect and it'll feed through into Zeta, which itself is trading at a discount. And the inherent assets inside Zeta, Cape Span, Zard, Carp Agri, also have great long-term prospects. So that's why I think Zeta, which when I chose it at 606, had a run to about 710. It's now back, I think, in the, in the 660s. Uh, still, I think, has legs going forward. We've seen... We've seen We've seen very early discussions so far. For example, uh, Chris Schiller, the CEO of Astral Foods, came out with a, with a comment a week or two ago saying the uncertainty uh, regarding land in this country, which is a very emotive issue, um, has caused some potential uncertainty because why would you as a large company or even as a wealthy farmer uh, want to start investing in your own property if at some point the government is going to come along and just snatch it away from you with no compensation? So at this stage, it's a, it's a discussion point. Uh, it's a political hot potato, which we have, we have no certainty on. But I think what it does do is if I, if I was a very large investor looking to put money into agriculture, I certainly would curtail or hang, or hang back my investment until I had some clarity. And I think that's what's, that's what's going to be the, the, the cause of, this, uh, of, of quieter investment in agriculture uh, for the next 12 to 18 months. But most of these companies are operating companies. So they, they don't physically own land. You know, Pioneer doesn't physically own the fields that grows the maize and the soya. It just buys from other people and it just processes. So most of these operations, are they tend to buy in products produced by other people. So there'd be no real impact. The impact would be if there is uncertainty, for example, in the commercial farming field. And some of the large farmers say, you know, that's it. We're just walking away from all of this. There could be a food security issue. Now, I, I love statistics. Uh, a very good friend of mine, is, his name is Wandila Sehobo. He's one of the country's leading agricultural economists. He tells me that there are only 800 commercial farmers in this country that produce 80% of all the food we eat. 
Now, that's a staggering number. So if 10% of those farmers suddenly say, that's it, we're leaving. We're not going to give a farm to the sons of our daughters. We're going to sell up or walk away, move to Zambia, Zimbabwe, Australia, you name it. And 10% of this country's entire food production suddenly vanishes overnight. We as a country are in trouble. So I think the government needs to be cognizant of the fact that there's a very small pool of people in this country that actually produce all our food security. So whilst it's a very emotive issue, I think a very delicate balance needs to be um, discussed between food security, the need for land to address significant past injustices, but to keep production there to feed the masses. Because if there's no water, we'll have riots in the streets. If we have no electricity, yes, we can, we can have a torch. But if there's no food, then we have serious civil war in this country. And look what happened to Zimbabwe when the country had land redistribution there. The agricultural output completely collapsed. And a once self-sufficient country had to rely on food imports. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen here. But it's something that needs to be considered going forward. So that's uh, that's Zida's. Well, it would be because, you know, ultimately, uh, if, you know, to move away from the presentation just for, for one second, ultimately, if it were to be a collapse in the underlying supply of basic inputs, maize, soya, sunflower, even, even for example, chicken and, 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 and cattle, you know, in the, in the ultimate worst case scenario, yes, these companies would, would, have a, would have a dramatic impact. But that would be, you know, if we went to a complete collapse in the agricultural sector, which at this stage, you know, one can't predict what's going to happen. Uh, I'm sure the government under, under dear old Cyril uh, will not be that foolish, but we will see. Astral Foods, as I said, uh, a company that I've had a, a long association with and a stock that's performed extremely well in the last year and a half for me. Chosen at about 124 Rand, it's made four of my price targets in the last 18 months. 160, 200, 250, and recently it made 300 Rand. And my new price target is 350 Rand. Um, I was at the Astral Foods AGM on the 7th of uh, February, the only analyst there, because very few analysts actually go to AGMs. And I encourage anyone to actually go to an annual general meeting because you get management to yourself. And they're very happy to chit chat over a cup of tea and a biscuit and tell you exactly what's going on. So in early February, I got, I got a whiff uh, from the very buoyant management mood that Astral was going to have an extremely good uh, reporting period coming up to its March interims. And last Monday, uh, at the height of a Tiger Brands listeriosis scandal, on the same day, Astral Foods issued its trading update, stating that earnings year on year, or like on like, were going to be up over 400%. Uh, and uh, they're going to be reporting a minimum of 18 Rand and 16 cents at the interim stage. And for full year last year, they made just over 19 Rand and paid you a, paid you a 10 Rand 55 dividend. So Astral, uh, in my expectation, uh, was a stock the market physically didn't understand. It didn't understand how well the company was doing, how significant a benefit of significantly lower input costs was having on the company, and a mixed change. They were moving away from what we call the basic IQF product, which is the bulk two kilogram raw chicken towards more value added product, more fresh, more product going into the quick service restaurants, the KFCs, the Nando's, the, the Hungry Lions, et cetera, et cetera. And that incremental margin mix meant that this company had a dramatic profit uplift, which we saw a week last Monday with earnings up a minimum of over 400%. So even though the stock is now trading at around 308 Rand, you could have picked this stock up a week last Monday on the, on the day of a Tiger Brands uh, issue at 264 Rand. It got smacked on the day of its uh, profit update because the market was too busy uh, slamming everything in the food sector because they thought everything that was food related had some form of taint. And Astral Foods on the back of a truly astonishing trading update fell 11% on the day. It, sub it subsequently has bounced back. So the trading range in Astral in the last 10 days has been 264 Rand, 319.66. It's not bad, eh? So you could have made 20% in Astral if you would have believed the story as I did last Monday. So even at current prices, uh, with, a, with a very good interim ahead and an even better second half, um, I think that Astral is a, is a core play in any food portfolio. And some of my clients were taking profits in Astral in the 250s, 260s, uh, when I told them not to because I thought a much better period was coming, uh, must be, uh, must be uh, plucking their feathers right now at, uh, at selling too early. And if, as I said at the start of my presentation, that the, uh, the harvest this year uh, in maize and soya uh, is going to be between 13 million tons in maize and a very good crop in soya, 
it means that input costs will, st will stay lower for longer, given the 4 million ton carryover of maize we saw from last year, which means that companies that use a lot of maize, and Astral buys 800,000 tons a year uh, in one single contract with Sendez as, an, as a matter of interest, um, will do significantly better again in 2019. Senves, uh, again a company that I've covered for nearly a decade. Uh, it was an OTC company. Uh, it's now on ZARX because farmers hate spending money. And as we all know, the JSC loves charging fees for everything. And Senves didn't really want to spend the cost of, uh, of listing on the main board of the JSC. So they went ZARX. Uh, I think uh, uh, I did tell them that was a fallacy because uh, on, a, on a main board, you get much better coverage from institutional investors. And uh, so Senves currently is not owned by a single uh, major institutional investor. Uh, I tell people that Senves is the biggest company in agriculture, in agriculture which you've never heard of. Market value about 2.2 billion rand, revenue of 10 billion rand, and at its height was making half a billion rand a year in profit. Uh, it's the second biggest grain handler and grain store in the country after AFCRI, which is owned by a private equity company. And this company has had a, an astonishing uh, 12 months on the back of the pickup in the maize harvest in 2017. Uh, interim earnings which came out uh, uh, before Christmas showed a 90%, no, an 80% rise on like on like to 108 cents a share. Uh, the peak earnings in Senves in 2013 was 1 rand 52. And this stock is currently trading at around 12 rand. So the P of this company which pays you very, very good dividends and has an extremely conservative management and a balance sheet uh, structure. Uh, it's probably trading right now in a P of around nine. Now, I picked my words very carefully here. I nearly listed Senbez on the main board of a JSC many years ago. But there's a catch. The catch is that Senbez has a pyramid holding structure where basically some wealthy farming families in Clarksdorp, where this company is based in the northwest, control Senbez Bell. Senbez Bell owns around 60% of Senbez. So in order for Senbez to do better, it needs to unbundle its structure because the JSC is not fond of pyramid holding structures listed on the main board of the JSC. There has been discussions that Senves Bell will be collapsed. If it is collapsed, that will be peri pursuit to them doing a large transaction in the agricultural space. I'm led to believe that discussions are underway to bulk up the company. And if that does occur, then the Senves Bell structure will collapse. Now, Senves Bell currently trades at a 50% discount to the Senves share price, but you have to be a farmer to buy Senves Bell. So if you, are, if you were happy enough or if you, if you were lucky enough here in this audience or on the webcast to own a farm, then I'd certainly knock on Senves' door and buy some Senves Bell shares at a huge discount to NAV. Because at some point in the next 12 to 18 months, this company will unbundle and will list on the main board of a JSC. And I've done a number of investment papers on this stock, saying if it were to list the main board of a JSC, I can easily see a stock price of Senves of between 22 and 24 rand a share. And we're currently trading at 12, and it pays you a very nice dividend. So in the course of this year, um, even though the underlying farming sector is currently under the whip, um, because the farmers have seen uh, quite benign farming income, so even though we've had a very good crop in maize, the price has fallen. So farm incomes on a, on a real like-for-like -like basis have really gone nowhere. So farmers have spent less on capital equipment, less on requisites, less on baling wire and poles, et cetera, et cetera. So companies that supply those products into the sector have been a bit under stress. But Senves is a very large, conservatively managed company with a number of interests in financial services, grain handling, logistics, and storage, which has counteracted a lot of weakness in the retail side. So I'm expecting a good growth in earnings this year, between 20 and 25 percent, roughly. And I think the current share price of around 11.50 to 12 rand, it's certainly a stock that I would tuck away uh, in a pension fund on a, on a three to five year view, uh, collect my dividends, and just wait for the unlock to happen. Oh, yeah. These current slides, I'll just quickly uh, flash through. The main predication of my food selection in 2017 was based on these slides. A significantly bigger maize harvest than the market was then expecting at the start of, 2000 and start of 2017. Because I do a lot of work in the farming sector. I have on-the-ground information. And the on-the-ground information often doesn't tie in with what the greater market often thinks. There's always a bit, of a bit of a time lag. So I was going out in very early January saying there's going to be a big harvest coming that will have dramatic impacts to food companies, lower input costs, et cetera, et cetera, which predicated my buys on Astral, Pioneer, et cetera, et cetera. The market eventually caught up 
uh, in late January, early February with a, with a much bigger harvest, and the rest is history. The underlying total harvest uh, for 2017 was 17.7 .7 million tons from a 7.7 .7 million ton 2016 harvest. And I get these charts every day. You know, as an analyst, you have to look at a lot of, uh, lot of very interesting things to make a, an opinion on, uh, on investing in stocks. And one of the key things I look at on a daily basis, apart from uh, the SAFEX price of the underlying soft commodity inputs, is the rain chart. I get daily rain charts sent to me because if it's dry in certain parts of the country, then crops simply won't grow. And this is the chart that I had in uh, a beginning of 2017, stating that in the west of the country here, where white maize is grown, it was pretty dry. And in the east, where yellow maize is grown, it was very wet, which meant, if you were to extrapolate out, that the white maize harvest would be down year on year, or not as high as market expectations, but the yellow maize harvest would be quite plentiful. What has subsequently turned out in the, in the corresponding weeks and months is that uh, this part of the country has had a fair bit of rain, although where we sit down here, a little, little pimple just here, we've had no rain. So the underlying expectation right now for the total maize harvest in this country is 13 million tons. Now, as I said to you at the start of the presentation, this country uses around 10 million tons a year for domestic needs, and the balance is generally exported. So uh, we, we still have 4 million tons left over from last year. So we are at a 13 million ton commercial harvest, which is probably a 14 million ton total harvest if it includes small-scale farmers. There will be a carryover again into 2019 which again will predicate my selection of certain food stocks into 2019 if I believe that prices of inputs will remain lower for longer. So uh, daily rain charts might, might sound uh, an esoteric thing to look at, but it's something that I, that I look at uh, on a daily basis. So again, I'll, I'll flip through these because this is all uh, a bit academic now. At the start of the year, uh, depending on how the rains were, were, were looking to forecast, the crop could have been as low as 10.5 to 11 million tons, which would have had an impact to food companies. It didn't because the, cr the crop is now forecast at 13 million tons because the rain came albeit a month late. So I'll flip through that side as well because uh, I said don't be alarmed at the possible headlines because there's plenty of maize carryover. Food stocks will not be affected. And I haven't been. The second part of my presentation are my main small cap stocks. Every year I try and choose stocks that are either not well covered, or in many cases my job is to raise the consciousness of my institutional clients towards smaller companies which are undergoing some internal change which could have significant benefit to the management or the shareholders of a company if they're predicated. So the stocks that I chose this year were AEEI, IO, Grand Parade, and Ellie's Holdings. That's how the stocks have performed uh, since I chose them. Anger Group is my wild card towards the end. It's a separate slide. Uh, it wasn't in my main presentation. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was in as what I call a wild card because uh, an analyst always has to have a, 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 a ballsy call just to annoy his clients. And I certainly like annoying my clients a great deal. And uh, in many cases, I put something in where they think I'm completely insane. Uh, but in many cases, uh, I'm quite lucky and things pan out. So Anchor Group uh, went under 328 when the market hated the stock. And I was slammed on social media for actually covering the stock and, uh, and, 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 and putting it in. But that stock, within a matter of two weeks, was up 33% on, on me including it in my, in my top stocks. It's come off a wee bit since then, but it's still up nearly 20%. And results are coming out in two weeks' time. So the others have done, you know, indifferently, up and down, but it shows you where these, these recent highs were in the weeks preceding my selection. Uh, and, I, and again, even though it's a small little gain, I'm still beating benchmark quite nicely. So it's all about beating benchmark, which is what my clients look at. So we start with AEEI, uh, a simple but complex company. Uh, it's basically a, a Western Cape-based empowerment company. Uh, I call it a poor man's brimstone. Uh, Brimstone is a company that I cover, which is an extremely uh, well-run uh, empowerment company with some really choice quality assets hidden inside it. And AEI could, is, could be seen as its second cousin. Also some nice assets, but not, not the same quality as Brimstone. But this company, when I chose it last year at Free Rand, uh, was up 80% last year as the inherent value uh, inside AEI from a listing of Premier Fishing, which listed in March last year, and then in IO, the tech company, uh, became uh, became apparent. So when I chose AEEI last year, it was on the realization that this company, which was at that point, was trading on a significant discount to NAV. As it started to have a 
to have more transparency in his, in, in his unlisted portfolio. The market would then reflect the more transparent nature of the asset valuations into a share price. Because if you have director's valuations, it's a thumb suck as to what a company's share price is worth. But if you can, if you can physically see on the JSC what a company is trading at I and mean, extrapolate that out into an investment holding company, then you get a much better sense of what a discount should be. So a discount in AEI narrowed, you know, narrowed quite nicely and the share price was up 80% last year. So why did I choose it again this year? Uh, purely because when I wrote this uh, in January, the, some of the parts of AEI, it's, it's theoretical, some of the parts, was 17 Rand 26, and it was trading at 7 Rand 50. Then we listed IO. Now, IO is basically British Telecom, which is a FTSE, list, a FTSE 100 listed tech giant, which is the leading player in this country in, in providing telecom solutions and backbone services to major corporations, Unilever, Sassel, Anglo-American and government departments. IO had a problem. The problem was it was big, it was successful, and extremely profitable. AEEI were their small empowerment partners, but last year, the government, in its infinite wisdom, changed the BEE codes in ICT, which meant you as a company saw your BEE codes fall dramatically, which is why many were scurrying around last year trying to find new empowerment partners and to up their scorecard back to what they used to be. So British Telecom was doing some substantial contracts with major corporations in this country, including government departments, and it suddenly saw its BE score fall quite dramatically. In order to win new contracts in 2018, it had to get a scorecard back up to get these major contracts. So AEEI, through a combination of reverse asset swaps and sales and all sorts of, uh, of, of, of shenanigans uh, in, uh, in the, late, in the late, late, end, late period of last year, ended up owning 49% of the operating assets of British Telecom. Now, I told you this company listed on the 21st of December worth 14.8 billion rand, and AEEI overnight had a stake worth just under 8 billion rand because they needed the empowerment structures. AEEI's market valuation, when I wrote this, was 3.6 billion, but IO stake alone is worth nearly eight. And it also has stakes in Pioneer Foods, Signia, Premier Fishing, uh, and other small assets worth about 740 million rand. So I was saying that as the underlying potential of IO starts to come through, and it's been very volatile in the JSE, its trading range has been between 25 rand and 45 since listing, because it's very illiquid. Um, the inherent discount, which is currently in AEEI, will again start to unlock. But here's a little tidbit for you. AEEI's current market value is roughly three and a half billion rand. Its net asset value is still around 17 rand a share. When they sold their assets into IO in exchange for a stake, they got a billion rand of cash from a listing in their balance sheet. So you're a company, market value, 3.5, 3.6 billion rand, with a net asset value probably north of 7, 8, 9 billion, sitting on a billion rand of net cash, which equates to 2 rand a share. Now the question is, if you're trading at 7 rand a share, and you've got a billion rand in cash in your balance sheet as an investment holding company looking after basic um, you know, empowerment investors from, a, from rural communities and poor communities. What are you going to do? Give the money back. So I'm assuming that at some point, a large slug of the cash inside AEEI with two rand a share currently will be given back to shareholders. So at seven rand a share, if they give back just half the money this company is sitting on a dividend yield of 14%. Now, there's something for you. A little tidbit. IO. Well, I've discussed IO. As I said, it was a, it was a very large listing, but uh, was done by PSG. Uh, happened on the 21st of December. Um, it wasn't widely, um, it wasn't wi uh, widely publicized to the marketplace because it happened literally so quickly. Uh, the stock was predominantly placed with empowerment part parters. Um, the, PIT, the PIC took a very large stake. Uh, because of its very tight shareholding structure between AEEI owning 49%, the PIC owning 30%, managers, etc., etc., the stock is incredibly volatile. In fact, I'll tell you how volatile it is. There was one day last week when I tweeted that the stock fell 28% in one day in 412 shares. So basically, this multi-billion rand company was smacked down several billion rand in 412 shares. The next day was up 14% in 3,812 shares. 
So this stock is certainly not for the faint-hearted. So I tell some of my clients, uh, if, they're, if they're feeling cheeky, which I often am, you stick in a very cheap bid in the system at a crazy price, 25, 28, 30 rand, hoping that at some point somebody wants to sell and they hit the bid and you get some cheap stock and it then rebounds back. So why have I chosen IO? For the same reason I, I chose AEEI. IO, in its old guise, is basically British Telecom in a brand new fancy little black dress. It's as simple as that. Uh, if you go into their website, British Telecom um, is, a, is, a, is a major player in ICT. Um, the contracts they have uh, are substantial. They have a near billion rand contract with, with, with Sassol, an 800 million rand contract with Unilever, a 600 million rand contract with Anglo-American, 100 million rand contract plus with varying government departments. And this company, under its pre-listing forecast statement, is forecast to increase its earnings to 1.2 billion rand by 2019. So this is not a small company. This is a company with a material revenue base, which in theory, if you believe a PLS forecast, which was done by a reputable firm of PSG and all signed off, will make north of a billion rand in profit in 2019 and earnings of around three rand 50 a share and has a two times dividend cover. So it should start paying very good dividends to shareholders in 2019 if the uh, forecasts are met. And of course, back to its parent owner, which is AEEI. So these are the numbers that I put in there. Um, so it's, uh, it's looking like, a, like an interesting little play. It's not cheap currently. It's trading at about 41 Rand. So the PE probably is about, call it a 15 or a 16. But the company simply is not that well followed. And there aren't many, there aren't many companies out there of this size that are unfollowed. Now, we have one of the best IT analysts in the country working for Venani. His name's Ernest Kaplan. Uh, and he doesn't cover IO. He covers EOH, which is just direct, direct comparison. Um, but he doesn't cover IO because it just slipped into the marketplace. So in many cases, um, there are stocks out there which certainly aren't well known or well covered by the wider market or analysts, which you as a private client can do some work on, pick up the, the underlying pre-listing statement, look at the website and do some, do some, do some digging, and you can pick up a, a nice little company with prospects which the market has yet to pick up on because there aren't any material institutional shareholders who own the stock apart from a PIC and some of the large empowerment players like Sentio and Marzi Capital. It's not on my coronation, Old Mutual, Investec, Sanlam, Momentum, Alan Gray. None of them own it because they weren't given a chance to look in, in the listing because they weren't empowered. So it's a stock that uh, is very volatile currently, unknown, but I think could have some interesting potential going forward given the space it trades in and uh, its basic uh, background. It's basically British Telecom. Why is it volatile? It's, volu it's, volatile. it's volatile because they place the stock in a very narrow group of hands. So it's very, very tightly held. So if, for example, a staff member got some stock and for whatever reason needs to sell some shares, the bid and offer is actually quite tight. If you, if you look at the bid and offer on IO at any point in time, it's extremely thin and also quite wide. So the double can be, in a one point last week, it was 24 Rand to 45, which is staggering for a company. You normally expect spreads of a company to be very, very tight. So somebody needs to sell and they want to get out, they will hit the bid. So the price automatically goes to that price, which it did last week. It hit 26 Rand a share in 412 shares. Then somebody saw it was look, looking cheap, they paid 28 Rand and then it bounced back to 41. So it's purely due to liquidity. The stock is so tightly held. If somebody wants to sell, they just hit the bid. And that's the issue. Liquidity will improve in time. There are a number of transactions on the go currently inside IO as they're looking to bulk up the business with, with their acquisitions. But as it stands right now, it's just not well known and not well followed. So you get volatility, which to me, uh, as an analyst that looks at companies like this, is an opportunity. So as I said, a cheeky bid in the right price means you could pick up cheap stock uh, at a very low price and watch it bounce back up again. So moving on to Grand Parade, uh, another Western Cape-based company, which for years has underperformed. Now, why is it underperformed? Its underlying casino assets, uh, Grand West Casino, its bingo and gaming assets have done quite well. It gives great predictable cash flow. But in the tight economy we've had in the last few years, the gaming assets have done well, but they, they have seen a decline year on year in their underlying profitability, but they are still profitable. So what Grand Parade has done is it's decided many years ago to recycle the cash flow uh, from its gaming interests by moving into the fast food segment. So they've got the Burger King franchise in this country, and they own all the Burger Kings outright. Not franchised, 
the all corporate stores. They then also bought in Baskin Robbins, the ice cream company, and latterly Dunkin' Donuts. Now, when you start up any major fast food brand, you have to have manufacturing on the ground, stores on the ground, marketing, etc., etc., etc. And that is extremely expensive. Ask Starbucks and Domino's, uh, who are owned by Taste, who have lost 350 million rand to date, but trying to get those two major brands off the ground. Now, luckily, Grand Parade has got uh, good assets and a good cash flow to fund the losses uh, in fast food. Last year, uh, they lost 61 million rand in their fast food interests, of which uh, Burger King, it's, I think, alone lost north of 30 million rand. By June this year, they are forecast to break even. And at the AGM, uh, Hassan Adams, the current chairman of Grand Parade, indicated that the company will move into profit uh, in the latter half of 2018 and to material profit in 2019. And they've changed the model of fast food. What they wanted to do was to physically own everything. Most companies tend to franchise their operations and collect a franchise fee and then sell additional services into the franchise uh, franchisors to make additional money. Grand Parade thought, we, we want to own everything. We want to own every store, every truck, every manufacturing operation, which is terribly costly. That cost them a great deal of money in terms of losses, and the shareholders are very unhappy, which is why the stock is now trading at a 45% discount to net asset value. So they decided at the last AGM, and they communicated to shareholders and the market that they intend to sharply reduce the ownership of loss-making brands. They're going to focus purely on Burger King, which is about to break even. Baskin Robbins, the ice cream brand, will be no longer a corporate-owned business. It'll be a bit like haagen -Dazs. You can go into any main franchise, any main retail store, and buy a tub of Baskin Robbins ice cream like you can buy a tub of haagen -Dazs ice cream. You don't have to physically go to a haagen -Dazs or a Baskin Robbins store to buy, a, you know, to buy an ice cream. And in Dunkin' Donuts, which competes against Krispy Kreme, uh, they're going to uh, apparently sell that business off to a, a major international player, which has the, uh, the Dunkin' Donuts franchise internationally. So what they intend to do is, is to sharply reduce the losses seen inside food, which has been a hindrance to the company share price and the perception of the company. Now, as of this morning, or as of yesterday when I wrote this, the company share price was vacillating between 240 and 250. So it hasn't really gone anywhere because the market wants to see physical delivery of the promises that the chairman made at the last AGM. Now we've, got, we've got results out from Grand Parade this coming Friday. 10 o'clock, I'm going for a presentation of the Table Bay. If at, the, if at those results, we start to see that the promises that the chairman made six months ago are starting to be realized, then the share price could perk up. If he doesn't start delivering on his promises, he's told his shareholders he's doing X and he hasn't delivered, he's gonna be in trouble. So this coming Friday, when the, when the GPR results are out to me, will be key. He'll either, he'll either start to deliver on his promises, or he'll have some excuses to make. So right now, the stock's still trading at a very large discount to net asset value. And if, as he, as he indicated, the losses will start to lessen, to move into profit, uh, this company's net asset value should start to, uh, to narrow. Well, as it stands right now, one of uh, GPI's biggest assets is, I think it owns an 18% stake in Spur Corporation, and it's Spur's uh, empowerment partner. Now, Hassan Adams at the AGM indicated he wants to take that stake in Spur to 25%. Now, Spur Corporation's been around for 50 years. It's a company that I followed for many, many years. They own Spur, the great brand. They also own you know, Panerotti's and John Dory's and a number of other Mainline brands, Hassar's Grill, et cetera, et cetera. But the main brand is in burgers and in, and in Spur Corporation. There is a school of thought, but by putting Burger King and Spur together, you get economies of scale, you get a very well-known seasoned management team in Spur Corporation running the fast food side because Burger, uh, Burger King is owned by GPI. What do GPI know about running fast food companies? It's a gaming company. It's an investment holding company. So the school of thought is, in one second, the school of thought is that Burger King perhaps will be sold into Spur Corporation in exchange for more shares in Spur going into GPI. Now, at this stage, it's just a discussion. It's been, it's been discussed at the boards, but nothing has yet, yet occurred. But it, it is a permutation play. When I say, when, you, you must pick your words very carefully. Uh, when you say confused, in, in which way? I do, I do not take any judgments on people's investment philosophy. I personally don't invest in gambling, tobacco, or in arms. But, you know, again, yeah. No, but uh, you know, 
he, he considers himself, he's, a, he's an investment holding company. And he, interestingly, at the AGM, he said he wants to invest in companies that will make him money, to which uh, some people in the audience said, well, so far to date, you invest in companies that haven't made us any money. We shall see what happens going forward. There is a very large franchise fee. So basic, basically, Burger King is owned by a private equity company. And interestingly, many years ago, the rights to Burger King in this country were actually won by Taste Holdings. Uh, I know that because I was Taste's corporate broker. And we negotiated a transaction to, to, to get Burger King into Taste Holdings, which at that stage uh, owned St. Elmo's Pizza, Fish and Chip Company, and some of the smaller assets. It walked away from a deal because the, the onerous nature of a transaction regarding the franchise fee back to the parent company and the fact that the, 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 under the franchise agreement, they had to put down a certain number of stores within five years, which would have been extremely costly, meant that the taste balance sheet at that point could not accommodate taking on Burger King as they walked away. A year later, GPI picked it up because they physically had the balance sheet to roll out. Well, I've, I, October last year, I wrote, I wrote uh, an investment thesis stating that given that taste holdings is, uh, is, uh, is basically on the bones of its ass, and uh, recently had a very large emergency rights issue. Uh, and it's February, it's, February in, it's February results uh, will be very interesting because the December trading period was not kind to its jewelry or its fast food businesses. Um, if it wasn't for the last rights issue, which was bankrolled by its major shareholder, the risk of its value fund, the company in theory was bankrupt. Uh, they expanded far too quickly in Starbucks and in Domino's Pizza, and the economy didn't play ball either. So I, I made a, a, a bold protestation, or a, a bold call that uh, me being me with my old corporate broking hat on. If you had a grand coalition of GPI, which has money uh, and valuable assets which could be sold to fund expansion, you'd end up with a, with a fast food company which would own Burger King, Dunkin' Donuts, Baskin Robbins, Starbucks, and Domino's Pizzas. How great would that be? With the money behind them. But it was just an idea that I had. I often do these things just to annoy people, just to see if, if, if anything will bite. But it, it probably won't happen because um, at the end of the day, Taste so far have lost 350 million rand uh, from its, uh, from its uh, Starbucks and its Domino's Pizza's ventures. And uh, I'm not going to see a profit in that business for quite some time. So I think if GPI were to ride in right now to try and rescue the company, I don't think the GPI shareholders would be very happy at carrying that can. So I don't see it happening. But as it stands right now, the risk of its value fund, I think, owns between 60 and 70 percent of taste holdings. So I'm, I'm arguing now, we'll just delist it. Or why should it even be listed? It's, it's basically irrelevant. Uh, moving on quickly, what's the time, Simon? What's... I'm going to zoom through this quickly. Uh, Ellie's Holdings is a company that I've, that I've been in and out of for years. Um, if, you were, if you're a Twitter follower of mine, and uh, I have many Twitter haters and many trolls, which I'm always very kind to because if you're in the media, you have to take the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, I first picked up coverage of Ellie's Holdings at 135. Uh, it, it ran up to about 9 rand 90. Uh, I then uh, uh, turned negative on the company at about 7 rand 40 uh, in 2013 because the ESCOM contracts they then won uh, to convert people's geysers and light bulbs and shower heads to more energy, energy efficient uh, methods vanished overnight because of ESCOM's difficulties. And it was clearly evident uh, as an Ellie's analyst that the company was going to be in financial difficulties going forward with a major contract having been snatched from underneath it. Uh, the share price since subsequently fell on the back of a combination of uh, mismanagement inside uh, the core business and the infrastructure side. It fell from 7 grand 40 to a low of 16 cents. Uh, it fell to 16 cents in early August last year. And having been, uh, having been a bull on Ellie's and ridden it up and then sold it from 740 down and extremely harsh uh, on the rights issues. They had three rights issues at 1 Rand 15, which some of my clients uh, bankrolled. And I got some significant flack from my clients for being negative on the stock. Um, it fell to 16 cents in August. So why did Clark suddenly change his mind after three or four years of negativity and put a buy in the stock? The answer was quite simple. They turned the corner. Losses in infrastructure had, uh, had, had, uh, had been extinguished and were, were, were passed off. Standard Bank had renegotiated their loan. And the company was now making money. So at 16 cents, I thought, it's not going to go bust anymore. Uh, it certainly isn't looking like a stock that I'd put my grandmother into. But it certainly isn't a stock that uh, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be trading at these low levels. And at the interim results stage uh, to October last year, they produced uh, an earnings per share of three, three cents a share. And I'm forecasting we'll make between six and eight cents of this year. So when the stock was trading at uh, 16 to 20 cents, if you're going to earn between 
six to eight cents a share, you're tra probably trading on a P of two and a half to three. Now, there aren't many companies in that space that I cover that trade at that sort of low PEs for too long. So I chose the share at, uh, at uh, 29 cents publicly on the, uh, in mid-August with a quick target price of 60 cents. It got there within two weeks. Uh, Clark changed his view and the thing ran. Uh, it, it then fell back uh, towards the, the sell-offs towards the end of last year with all the ANC shenanigans of Cyril and Mr. and Mrs. Zuma. And it got to 29 cents to 34 cents again. So 34 cents, I chose the stock again uh, with a target value of 60 cents. It got to 45 very quickly. It's now back to 39. Uh, it's an April year end. Results will be out uh, probably in early June. And I'm forecasting still. They'll probably show earnings of 6 to say 8 cents this year and probably make north of 10 next year. So at 34 cents, the stock is, trade, is still trading on a very, very low PE. Now, I'm not saying you take your granny's pension fund or your children's school fund and buy Ellie's Holdings. What I'm saying is in this product, I have to put something in that is a bit of a, bit of a gamble, but a, but, a, but a structured gamble. And I think that Ellie's Holdings at 34 cents, I think may surprise. And I was trained many years ago by some very wise analysts. One of them was called Sid Vianello. Uh, who's a very old sage in retail, and he taught me a little, a little, little, little hand trick. It's called Four Seasons Make Fashion. If a company's completely bombed out, if it makes its first good number, the market goes, ah, we don't really care because you're bombed up, we, we're not going to look at you. If it makes a second, a second positive number, some people will say, oh, that's quite good. Maybe we'll start looking at you, but we'll do nothing. If it makes its third positive number, they'll say, damn, we didn't see that coming. You're actually recovering. We should start looking at you now and maybe nibbling at you. By the time the fourth number comes out, which is interim final, interim final, the stock is run. Ellie's has now had its first positive number and is about to have its second positive number. Four seasons make fashion. It's halfway through turning the corner. By the time the third number comes, if my predictions are right, this thing will start to run. And then the, the mainstream small cap institutions will start looking at it again, which they haven't done for the last four years. And then lastly, quickly, my wild card. Everybody thinks I'm mad putting in Anchor Holdings. I chose the stock at two rand a share when it listed many years ago uh, because Peter Armitage, the CEO, and I used to work together. He used to be my boss many years ago. So we've had, we've had this wonderful relationship. He's either been my client, I've been his client, he's been my boss, I've been his boss, but we've been friends for 20 plus years. Uh, but it doesn't mean I play anyone with any favors because if you aren't doing well, I'm going to go after you. And I did. So this stock went from two rand and I came up with a very bold target saying it was going to be worth 20 rand within three years. It got to 18 rand 80 in a year and a half. And then it went on a one-way ticket to hell. It hit a low uh, a few weeks ago of three rand 16. And the market always looks backwards. They never look forwards. So they looked at an awful 2017 where earnings were, were slammed with a profit warning. Uh, the strong rand shaved some of its earnings from its offshore operations off. And the share price literally dived. So when I chose a stock at, uh, at three rand 28, I was looking forwards because it makes its money on better market performance. With a Cyril bounce, the stock market's up over 20%. The underlying uh, valuation or value of the funds under management are also increasing, and there's net monthly inflow into the company. So it's doing better in 2018, but the market only looks backwards. I'm looking forwards. So it's telling you in, the, in its recent trading update that it's probably going to make between 36 and 40 cents a share. So let's pick a, a mid number, 38 cents. Now, 38 cents, when I chose the stock at 328, it's going to appeal about nine, which for an asset management company is actually quite low. Now, as a percentage of funds under management, it was trading on an AUM percentage of 0.9. Now, internationally, asset, asset management companies tr trade on between a two and a half and a four. So you're going to bought this business X cash on a 0.9 value, and it was very, very cheap. In October last year, I chose Signia uh, between 8.20 and 8.88.90. Everyone thought I was, I was completely insane, but Signia was bombed out. No one loved Nacht via Jiska. The company was going nowhere. The stock market performance was down, but the market looks backwards. I saw what was going on inside the company regarding margin mix, new funds under management, and products going forward. Signia came out with an astonishingly good profit number for its September year end, and it'll come up with an equally good interim number to its March interim period. The share price ran from 8.20 to 14.50 in a matter of six weeks. The same arguments that I'm using in Signia, I'm using with Anchor. The market is 
looking at a, at a bombed out company and they aren't looking at what's going ahead. Better market performance, substantial AUM inf inflows, et cetera, et cetera. And the share price of Anchor, when I put this in my, in my wild card, went from 3.28, it, it hit about 4.40, and it's now back to the, the mid to high freeze. I would say wait for results to come out. I don't think the market will like them that much. The share price may take a bit of a smack again, but I'd certainly be looking at it at that point, looking forward, because there are better times coming in Anchor compared to its past, and that's why I put it in. Sometimes you have to have a wild card. When the market hates a stock, because they're looking at what's gone, gone on behind them. They're looking in the rearview mirror. I don't look in the rearview mirror. I'm looking at the road ahead. And the road ahead is significantly better than what happened in the past. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my presentation. And uh, we might even have some time for question. If not, thank you very much. Uh, hmm? Gosh, I, I haven't covered New World in a, in, a, in a million years. I picked up New World in 1996 when the Goldbergs ran it, and they still do. And then many years ago, uh, Wild Rose Holdings became, part, became a, a major shareholder, which is, which is the Browse family business. It's had a remarkable run from its lows in, in the mid-20s. It was a huge net asset value play. Uh, it's, been, it's been turned around. Um, it's not a stock I currently cover purely because of liquidity. It's a nice business that has done well. But because of very, very tight liquidity, it's not a stock that I, that I actively cover because if a client says to me, Anthony, we love a new world story, buy me 50 million rands worth, it's not going to happen. So in many cases, I, I cover stocks, but I actually don't actively market them purely because of liquidity issues. Absolutely, yes. I actually spoke to the CIO, the CEO this morning. We have had some really bad news in the CIL last year. I mean, we had... I, I mean, I've known the CEO for a long time. I actually helped list the company. Uh, I have a large personal shareholding myself. And it's certainly not one I'd, I'd, I'd be selling. In fact, I actually bought some more of my, of my pension money at a lower 308 uh, in early December. Um, the company is waiting for these renewable energy contracts to be signed. When Cyril came into power, Jeffrey Debbie became the Minister of Energy, and he came out and said, we will sign these contracts on the 13th of March, which is yesterday. And then at midnight last night, the unions came out and said, no, no, we've got a court interdict. We cannot have these going ahead because jobs will be lost in the coal industry. So the contracts were yanked. A billion rand of revenue is waiting to be done for the next four years to CIL on the back of these contracts. So in the, in the announcement of the contracts going ahead, the share price ran sharply. On the announcement that the unions won an interdict, it fell today 9%. So we're now waiting till the end of March uh, for, the, for, the, for the court in Johannesburg to pronounce on if his interdict will actually hold or if the minister will get his way and sign. If he signs, then Conco, which is currently being restructured and downscaled, uh, will be a far more profitable entity. The underlying business inside CIL, which is Conlog, uh, Tractionel and the other assets are doing very well, thank you. We're, doing, we're making nice profits. Uh, this is a company that still makes north of 200 million rand a year. It's just that one part of a company dragged it down, which is now being sorted out. Um, is, it, is it a stock that I, that I would recommend people buy right now? The answer is no, because at the end of the day, you've seen a share price fall from 19 rand 60 to a low of 3 rand, and it's now bouncing between 350 and 450. Not many people are going to look at that. But I, again, I look forward, not backwards. And I'm waiting for the renewable energy contracts to actually be formally announced. And if they are, then the stock will look attractive again. But it's, it's certainly not going to go bust. Interestingly, on the 15th of February, uh, there was a major meeting of the bondholders. Now, the bondholders generally run a company if, if it's not doing that well. And there was a significant audit opinion which came out in favor of CIL being an inherently viable business and the bondholders agreed to roll over their covenants for another 12 months to give it breathing space to restructure itself. So that date of the 15th of February was a key date and CIL uh, was given a new lease of life. Well, it's a combination of factors there. Firstly, we've had changes at Sonogol, the, the oil industry. The oil price has moved up quite nicely from the low of the mid-40s to around 55, 60. But because they charge in dollars, under Cyril, the currency is strengthened. So we've gone from 14, 14 rand to the dollar now to about 11.50. So the translation, the translation uh, of profits in Angola back to rands will be impinged because of a strong currency. 
So it's a good business to be in longer term. You know, we all think about oil. You know, we're all going to need oil. Who's, who's, you know, who's not going to ever need oil in this, country, in this, in this globe? But the question is right now, for a combination of, 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 of reasons, uh, the oil sector in Angola is just not doing that well. But Angola is an oil-reliant economy. And as the demand for oil continues to pick up, and interestingly, recently, the Angolan uh, market, the Angolan economy devalued its currency, which, which spurred in inward investment. So in theory, in 2019, 2020, you should see more exploration based on a higher oil price and a more benign local currency. But in the short term for CIL, it'll still be profitable, but not as profitable as it used to be because of the strong currency.